go to the Home Office now, where Sir Mark Rowley's been speaking and gave a, a statement on uh, the Met's position in the past few minutes. Meeting with Home Secretary, some of her ministerial colleagues, and leaders of the CST, which is the organisation that helps protect Jewish communities from, from threats. Um, we all recognise this is really unprecedented times. The convergence of a range of issues, starting from hostile states, the Iranian threats that have been um, pushed out across the world, including onto the streets of the UK with 15 threats we've seen here over the last 18 months. The horrific and gruesome terrorist attack by Hamas, killing over a thousand Jews, which is um, stirring up um, issues across the world, including here and causing anxiety and fear, um, and also aggravating our own terrorist threats here. And we've got over 500 cases of uh, related to Islamist terrorists ongoing in the UK that colleagues are investigating. The growth in hate crime, um, uh, hate crime um, against Muslim communities in London is up threefold, but against Jewish communities it's 13-fold compared to this time last year for this period. That's a horrific number. Um, and it's not surprising that communities in that context are fearful and anxious, and that's what we were talking about today. On top of, of course, the protests which sort of give vent to a whole range of different opinions. Um, I was explaining how we are absolutely ruthless in tackling anybody who puts their foot over the legal line. We're accountable for law. We can't enforce taste or decency, but we can enforce the law. Um, and we've made um, 34 arrests so far over the recent protests. We've got another two, 22 cases on the back of those where we're searching for individuals, trying to identify people from photos. Um, and um, our counter-terrorism teams have got 150 cases triaged out of nearly 1,500 referrals, 100, uh, 150 cases of behaviour online, which is of deep concern that we're, and we're going, after those, um, going after those individuals. So there's a massive amount of operational work going on, and it's important that you can help, frankly, with... Um, making that visible to communities that we're doing that because we really get this. And then the conversation finished really around the line of the law and it's our job to enforce to that line. It's Parliament's job to draw that line and the thought that maybe events of the moment are illustrating maybe some of the lines aren't quite in the right place. There have been reports from Counter Extremism Commission and, um, and the Law Commission um, and more recently from um, Sir John Saunders with the Manchester Inquiry Inquest talking about the law needed to change to be stronger at dealing with extremism and I know that Home Secretary and her colleagues are really charged with that and thinking hard about that. So a constructive meeting in difficult times where um, sober and determined heads are what's required. Where do you think the law is lacking around extremism? I think the law that we've designed around hate crime and terrorism over recent decades hasn't taken full account of the ability of extremist groups to steer around those laws and propagate some pretty toxic messages through social media. And those lines probably need redrawing. It's a really difficult thing to do. If you look at the Counter Extremism Commission report, which I was involved in some nearly three years ago, that has many examples in there. One of the things we found was there are countries across the world who are, have got different frameworks which have some advantages. I mean, for example, um, uh, his Butteria, who were protesting at the weekend, and some of their protests caused deep concern. They're banned in Germany. Um, they're also banned across most of, the, um, most of the Muslim world, but they're banned in Germany. So there are frameworks which are more assertive in some respects than ours, and I think there's lessons to be learned. But that's for politicians and Parliament to draw the line. I'm focused. Me and my colleagues will keep being absolutely ruthless on enforcing the letter of the law and putting thousands of extra officers out in communities to reassure people who are understandably fearful given the ghastly events across the world. Thank you for this moment, Martin. Thank you. Right, so Mark Rowley there, uh, putting uh, pretty bluntly the Met's position that they are upholding uh, what the law says they can do, but clearly questioning whether the law itself needs changing. You will remember, of course, Suella Brabham saying she wanted police to apply the full force of the law. Uh, it follows these claims of jihad being um, shouted at these uh, various protests in London over the weekend. Uh, the Met had earlier said that its own counter-terrorism officers at the scene decided there was no offence uh, being committed, and that was backed up then by lawyers 
wires from the Crown Prosecution Service. But interesting there, Smart Rowley indicating that perhaps uh, the whole question about um, the law on hate crime needed to be looked at uh, by uh, the politicians. Let's now speak to former head of counterterrorism at the MOD, Major General Chip Chapman. Uh, Chip, thanks for your time. I know that your, your normal area of expertise in the, the military sense, but it's interesting there, I think Sir Mark Rowley was um, commenting on the use of social media, perhaps, as a weapon in this continuing war. Well, yeah, social media obviously goes across to the mainstream media, and that can pile lots of things. And he particularly mentioned Hizbut Tahrir being banned, for example, in Germany and not being banned here. Mm. Now, Hizbut Tahrir is an interesting group because, of course, one of the things that spun out of Hizbut Tahrir is al Harun and Chowdhury. And we know, for example, that if you take a lineage through the Muslim Brotherhood, Hizbut Tahrir, Al-Mujaharun, which has been banned and all its offshoots, we keep playing whack a mole with that. You get to people who are involved in terrorist incidents, uh, particularly with the Westminster Bridge and London Bridge one. Yeah. So we've got a real intersection here between social media, how that's powered, between ha hate crime, how that works, and between uh, various definitions. And it is a tricky area in what is uh, jihad and uh, not jihad. So greater jihad, for example, is supposed to be the spiritual struggling when you you try and get yeah. purity within the lesser jihad is the sort of call to arms. They are different things. Yeah, so we had this sort of uh, rather um, surreal uh, question as to, you know, whether police or anti-terrorism officers had to sort of take a dictionary to see which particular definition of jihad was being expounded at these, uh, these gatherings. But uh, just to sort of look a bit further at the difficulties for all the security services, um, we've got Hamas as a prescribed terrorist organisation. But then, as you indicated, these things become quite sort of fluid with a very uh, offshoots and other groupings that develop. Yeah, it does. And of course, there can be different parts of each organization which are banned or not. So until 2021, Hamas's military organization was um, banned, but the, the um, political organization wasn't. And they only caught up in legal terms to that in 2021, which is why you see well, you don't see Hamas flags uh, on the streets because most of the people are pretty savvy on these groups about yeah. where the, the law lies, and that um, that's the way they kind of work. Now, some of these groups are actually fifth columnists. You know, you've got to remember that their ultimate aim is to bring about a caliphate. Mm. Um, they are political Islam. They are Islamists, not Islam in terms of those yeah, who just yeah. believe in peace and tolerance and all that sort of stuff. Now, with your, your military hat on, I was just wondering what you made of the, uh, the latest uh, announcement from the IDF with their news conferences that they'd mounted these uh, what they call limited uh, forays uh, and uh, infantry and tanks involved. Is this what we think might be this ground offensive or ground operation? Not a big shock and awe, but something that's more targeted and limited? Well, that's certainly phase one. So uh, Defence Minister Gallant has said there are three phases to this. The first phase is the aerial campaign with drones, uh, artillery and air with with manoeuvre. And the manoeuvre there is to destroy operatives and damage infrastructure before you get to phase two, which he called the grand campaign, but actually at a lower intensity and eliminating pockets of resistance. So you could, in, in fact, see that raids and raids is not a mission verb it's not there to seize or hold territory yeah does two things it's either intelligence preparation of the battlefield or operational preparation of the battlefield for uh, the main ground force invasion but it's also that in terms of trying to keep the high ground more moral and psychological high ground yes. it might be that you have to use ground forces for distinction and proportionality allied to military necessity so you don't kill civilians who might be collateral damage uh, otherwise by using other means. Yeah, I, I think I ought to reflect, I think Rear Admiral Hagari used the word sortie. There is a sortie, so quite a specific term that he was using there. But j just to tie in with what we understand from Washington and the concern about the hostages, it's interesting now that there's yet another detailed update on the number of hostages, uh, up to 222 now, they say. Yeah, and the amazing thing is they see, keep seeming to go up on almost yeah. a daily basis. And that, that does create problems in terms of this intelligence preparation of the battlefield. So I do think that's one of the main reasons that uh, Israel have not gone in, in force, not that they, that's inevitable that they might do so. I think, secondly, the humanitarian 
uh, alleviation is part of that. Thirdly, I think there's still a need for some sort of diplomacy. And more importantly, though, they still have lots of targets through their high value target and joint prioritized target list to go after before they need to do anything in a very uh, a, a bigger, if, if they, that's deemed necessary, land sense. Right. So as you have Gallant said, this could last three months uh, and, and you've just expounded there exactly why that uh, could be a, a fairly protracted operation. Uh, Major General Chip Chapman, thank you very much for joining us with your assessment. Thank you.